Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the SN1 reaction, namely the unimolecular nucleophilic substitution reaction. In this case, we're going to be taking a look at how the bond spontaneously ruptures to create a carbocation intermediate, the resulting nucleophilic considerations for the actual substitution, and the stereochemical outcomes of the SN1 reaction. Let's go ahead and get started. So in general, the SN1 reaction follows a consistent pathway. That is to say, the SN1 reaction first involves a spontaneous bond dissociation from the carbon to the leaving group, followed by nucleophilic substitution onto the resulting cation that happens once the bond is ruptured. So, for example, let's say we start off with this tetrahedral carbon with the gold sphere representing the leaving group. What will first happen is that the bond from the blue atom, the carbon, to the gold atom, the leaving group, will spontaneously break. Both electrons will go with the leaving group to create an anion, and the carbon will remain with electron deficient with a positive charge. That will look like this, where the purple uh, dumbbell looking shape is the p orbital, the empty p orbital, that results when a cation is formed. So next, we have the nucleophile, which can then approach and attack that empty p orbital from either side, either the top face or the bottom face, with no preference because the cation is planar. And so what happens then is that the nucleophile can add in the same position as did the leaving group, which is the bottom case, right, where we do not have a stereochemical inversion, or it can add to the top face, this, or the bottom face this time, leading to an inversion of the stereochemistry. As a result, SN1 always produces both enantiomers at a chiral center. So how does the SN1 reaction transition state actually look? Well, if you've seen the SN2 video or are familiar with the SN2 reaction, you know that it goes through a pyramidal transition state, also known as an associative transition state. SN1 is a little bit different. For example, if we have this tetrahedral intermediate here, what will happen is that the electron density from the carbon leaving group bond will start to spontaneously shift upwards towards the leaving group. This is because thermodynamically, the leaving group is stable enough with negative charge density to fall out to be on its own. And so what will happen is that the leaving group will begin to stretch out and pull the electron density away from the carbon such that it takes up both electrons, leaving the carbon electron deficient. This is known as a dissociative transition state because there is no new bond forming at the same time that the leaving group is leaving. It's just being uh, pulled off by itself. And so there is an equilibrium that happens in uh, certain compounds between the quote unquote labile leaving group, that is to say a leaving group that can fall off easily, between it being attached and detached. In part of the equilibrium, the leaving group is detached to form a leaving group anion and a carbocation intermediate, while most of the time it is attached. However, that small percentage of the time where the leaving group is detached is what creates the carbocation, which is active towards the SN1 reaction. So the carbocation intermediate that forms when we have an SN1 reaction is oftentimes known as an open cation because it's the discrete separate intermediate from the rest of the compounds present in the reaction. The, ca the carbon in the process of the leaving group leaving has lost both electrons from its bond and as a result is completely electron deficient. This leaves an empty p orbital over the carbon, which has a trigonal planar molecular geometry as shown here. Now, the stability of the resulting cation that forms is directly related to the substitution of the carbon that the leaving group leaves from. Specifically, if we consider the possibility of a methyl, primary, secondary, and tertiary carbon, those create different cations. A methyl cation is just a CH3 with a plus on the carbon. That is to say, there are no bonds to the carbon other than a carbon-hydrogen bond. A primary carbocation has a single carbon-carbon bond in addition to the carbon-hydrogen bonds. Secondary has two carbon-carbon bonds, and a tertiary has three carbon-carbon bonds with no CH bonds. In terms of stability, the more substituted, that is the closer towards the tertiary carbon it is, the more stable the cation is. In fact, there's a line somewhere between the primary and the secondary cation where the primary and methyl cations 
are extremely unstable. In fact, they are far too unstable for the SN1 reaction. SN1 will never happen on a methyl or primary cation, whereas secondary cations are quote unquote okay, and tertiary cations are very stable and lend themselves very well to SN1 reactions. The reason for this is a little bit nuanced, and we're gonna go ahead and talk about it in a separate video. For now, it's worth understanding though, just the more substituted a cation is, the more stable it is, and the faster the SN1 reaction will go. So why is it that the SN1 cation stability impacts the rate of the reaction? Well, it has to do with something known as Hammond's postulate. Hammond's postulate states that for an endothermic reaction, that is one where delta H is positive, or the products are higher in energy than the, reaction, than the reactants, the transition state for that reaction will look like the products more than it does like the reactants. And so, in this case, because the cation is the product of the initial SN1 step, right, the breaking of the leaving group bond, that is an endothermic process, and so the transition state is going to be very similar to the energy of the cation, right? Cation energy is similar to transition state energy, and so the energy of the cation, aka the stability of the cation, is going to determine reaction rate. And this is because, again, transition state energy is what actually determines reaction rate. So in the case of an SN1 reaction, we find that the rate is simply equal to K times the concentration of the compound with the leaving group. The concentration of nucleophile does not impact the rate of the SN1 reaction. We can visualize this if we go ahead and plot a reaction coordinate. If you see the first step in an SN1 reaction is the breaking of the leaving group bond to give you the cation transition state followed by the carbocation intermediate. Because this is endothermic, the transition state energy is very similar to the cation energy. And so a higher cation energy means a larger transition state energy and therefore slower reaction, whereas a more stable cation lowers the transition state energy and gives you a faster reaction. Now, you might be wondering, well, there is an activation energy for the second step for the nucleophilic capture. And you would be correct. The thing is, though, that the carbocation formation energy, the Ea sub 1, is much, much larger than the activation barrier for nucleophilic capture. This is because the cation is such a reactive intermediate that the reaction tends to sort of just go once the cation has formed. And so it's actually that first step that is the rate determining step in this two step mechanism, right? Cation formation is rate determining. And so oftentimes you'll see that information presented in a table that looks like this where you have the relative rate of a reaction plotted against concentrations of the nucleophile and the initial compound of the leaving group. If you notice, when you double the concentration of the nucleophile, right, the second row in our table here, you notice the rate does not change. The relative rate is one in both of the first two rows, and that is because the rate of the reaction is completely independent of the leaving group. On the other hand, when you double the concentration of the initial compound, the rate of formation of product is doubled because there's twice as much of the initial compound present. Similarly, if you have both doubled, the reaction rate is only doubled rather than quadrupled because again, the nucleophile does not impact the reaction. So I wanna go ahead and talk a little bit now about the stereochemical outcomes of the SN1 reaction because they're a bit different from SN2. So as we noted, the SN1 reaction goes through a planar open cation intermediate. Because of this, the planar cation actually has two symmetric faces. The p orbitals are identical on both sides and there is no steric effect preferentially from one side or the other because of the trigonal planar geometry. So when the nucleophile approaches, it has the choice to attack from both sides, the top or the bottom face. The nucleophile can attack either face without preference and so what happens is that each side where the nucleophile attacks, because it will attack both equally, will create a distinct enantiomer. And so the equal preference for both enantiomers, both faces, will lead to a 50-50 mix of enantiomers in the final product. This is known as a racemic mixture. So if you initially start off with the R enantiomer for a chiral center, and then you perform a SN1 reaction on that chiral center, your product mixture will have an equal mix of R and S at that stereocenter, 
right? You will lose optical rotation at that stereo center because it has been racemized. So your alpha value will now be equal to zero degrees. The next major consideration we should think about for the SN1 reaction are its nucleophilic considerations. We know that SN2 requires very strong nucleophiles. However, the open cation intermediate is actually very reactive, so you don't need that super reactive nucleophile that you do in SN2. Pretty much any lone pair will work for an SN1 reaction, right? And so the typical nucleophiles that we see for SN1 are things like water, alcohols, or even carboxy acids, things that have lone pairs but do not have a negative charge, and the lone pairs are not as available as they are, say, in an amine, right, where the sp3 nitrogen lone pair is very nucleophilic. So these are very weak nucleophiles. We don't think of these as doing SN2 typically, but because the cation is so unstable, they're fine for SN1, right? They can attack the cation directly. Now, it's, worth impor it's important to note, strong nucleophiles, right, anionic nucleophiles, can participate in SN1 reactions. In fact, for a tertiary species, all substitution must be through SN1 because it's far too hindered for an SN2 reaction. However, in the case of a strong nucleophile, if it's able to attack quickly, i.e. in a secondary or primary cation, it will, or sorry, in a secondary or primary species, it will do so immediately without needing to wait for the cation to form, right? So strong nucleophiles with tertiary species will go through SN1, but for smaller species will go through SN2 typically. Weak nucleophiles must always go through SN1 because they're not strong enough to do the SN2 reaction. The final thing I want to go ahead and leave you with here is this quick animation overview of everything we've talked about with the SN1 reaction, which is going to show the bond rupture, the nucleophilic attack, and the racemization of the stereocenter. So initially, what will happen is, again, the bond will begin to rupture, leading to a polarization of the bond with the anionic character on the leaving group. As it's pulled away, we go into a trigonal transition state as the bond lengthens and ruptures, finally giving us a carbocation intermediate with an empty p orbital. Right? We have an equal symmetry on the top and bottom face. The nucleophile can then attack both the top or the bottom face. Let's say it attacks the bottom. The nucleophile bond then begins to form, pushing all of the groups towards the top, giving us a new tetrahedral substituted carbon with the opposite stereochemistry of what we initially started with. However, it could have just as easily attacked from the top face, giving us the same stereochemistry, overall leading to a racemic mixture. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you like what you saw, please go ahead and like and subscribe to the channel. To learn more, check out our other videos in the chemistry playlist, and if you're looking to branch out, check out our other videos in the other science playlist as well. See you next time.